Chains, chapter 37. Lady Seymour regained her strength by the day. I was no longer allowed to spend warm hours in her bedchamber. She took her breakfast and dinner alone, but joined the rest of the company for supper each night. Madam was sad by her husband's aunt's return to health. The next week passed in a kitchen uh, kitchen storm of flour and sugar for Christmas was fast approaching. Madam's list of required delicacies was endless. Gingerbread, pies of brandied peaches, and preserved cherries and mince meat and macarons and blanc menage and Jordan almonds and sugar candy, as many kinds of cake as there were fingers on both hands. I was the dog's body in charge of keeping the oven stoked with wood and the ashes cleared out, fetching forgotten ingredients from the market and beating eggs ten at a time till my arms near fell off. Two of the soldier wives got a terrible squabble the day of the uh, the wood pile froze. Hannah told Mary it was her turn to fetch home the buckets from the tea water pump, and Mary said no, it was Hannah's turn. Back and forth they went, the words getting hotter as their temper tempers grew sh shorter. I went yesterday, Mary said loudly as she poured boiling water into a basin. You know that, that for a fact because you told me that my nose was the color of cherry when I came in. Hannah shook her head as she scrubbed the floor. No, no, no. That was two days ago. Yesterday I slipped on the ice and fell on my backside. Near broke my tailbone, I did. Could barely come up the stairs this morning. Uh, you're a lying codface, you are, Mary said. Hannah threw the brush in the bucket and water splashed on the floor. Who are you calling a liar? Sarah, the boss lady, came through the door just as Mary rounded her table. the table, her hands balled up into fists. Sarah was getting close to her time and had a bit of a temper herself. She slammed the door hard and the whole house shook. Shut your gob, she shouted. I'll report the pair of you to the colonel if you don't straighten up and there'll be no more brawling or caterwauling in this kitchen. But they both said Sarah leveled such a glare at the pair. I thought her hair was going, or their hair was going to catch on fire. I suddenly saw a wavy clear uh, to my own purposes. Begging pardon, Miss Sarah, ma'am, I said uh, meekly. What do you want? She said, her eyes still on the other women. I can fetch the water, I volunteered. Mary shook her head back and forth. Oh, no, she won't. She'll tarry at the shops and get out of her own chores. Make one of the men do it, I say. I'm the first one to wake and build the fires up, I explained. The shops are still closed then. I'll dash to the pump and be back before the sun comes up. Sarah gave me a suspicious look. Why would you want on take on extra work, special when it comes with cold in the dark in the morning? I, ra I was raised in the country, miss. Too much time inside makes me feel poorly. I like walking in the fresh air, even if it's cold. It was mostly a lie, but the tea water pump was right close to the prison, and fetching water would give me a chance to check on Curzon every day. Hannah picked up her scrub brush and knelt on the floor again. Let her go, I say. Save us the trouble of freezing our tails off. She dipped the brush into the bucket. Don't know what possessed me to follow Jimmy to these godforsaken colony. The next morning found me head up or headed up the island long before sun rose. When I knocked on the guardhouse door of the prison, it was opened by a soldier I'd never seen before, a short man with black hair and sky blue eyes and a scowl. You can't come in, he said after I explained my errand. Regulations have been changed. Tell her about the windows, called another soldier, warning himself by the fire. The regulations permit civilians to deliver food and sundry provisions, but not firewood added the man at her uh, hearth yawning, but not firewood, repeated the first man. There will be regular patrols around the perimeter of the building to ensure that civilians do not tarry over long in, the, uh, in conversations with the prisoners, and we'll be checking on the grub you give them, said his companion. Guards will inspect all civilian donations, the first man said formally. If you deliver contraband items, you will be imprisoned yourself. I shivered once. Are scones and jams contraband? Not yet. Back outside, I walked around to the front of the building, trying to figure out where Curzon's cell lay. Some prisoners were already awake, their hands and arms wrapped in rags, sticking through the bars of the window. Curzon's cell lay to the back of the building. I rounded the corner and stopped. This was where the burial pits were dug. The pits were just a little smaller than the cells, dug down into the, down the height of a grown man. One of them had already been filled with bodies and covered again with dark mud. Two lay open and empty, sprinkled with snow like sugar on a cake. I did not want to know how many bodies fit in each. I shivered again and pulled the cloak tight, then turned my back to the uh, graves and counted the windows, two, three, four, until I came to the window. I hopped, or I hoped, led to Curzon Cell. The eastern sky had brightened enough uh, for me to see all around but the inside of the prison was dark. I stepped up to the building. The bottom of the window was just above the top of my head. I stood on a tiptoe and stretched my hands up to the bars. Hello, I called in a hushed voice. Curzon, anyone? 
The nasty fellow who tried to steal my bucket on the first day, dibbed in, leaned his face against the bars. He had a wet blanket uh, around his shoulders and Curzon's hat upon his head. Won't you let or won't let you in no more, eh? I changed or they changed the rules. Can you fetch my brother, please, sir? He's sleeping. I wanted to pull the bars apart and snatch the hat from his head and thrash him with my fists and shoes, but that was impossible. I forced honey into my voice in a humble tone. Well then, may I please speak to your sergeant? Sarge is dead. He turned his head and spat. I'm in charge now. I take the victuals you brought. I started to reach into the bucket and hand the scones through the bars, but stopped. How do I know my brother's not dead too? Wake him up, please. Dibden opened his mouth, but closed it without a word. His hunger was stronger than his temper, it seemed. He turned to someone in the cell. Get the black boy over here. A moment later, Curzon appeared at the window. He was shaking so badly he could barely stand, his eyes half closed, teeth chattering. He had no blanket around him, and there were puke stains on the front of his shirt. His gold earring was missing too. Curzon, Curzon, what ails you? What can I do? He did not hear me, or could not. He was insensible of his own name and where he was. Dibden joined Curzon at the window. Terrible, ain't it, how fevers and pox tear through this place? There was a hollow laughter in the cell. Give him his hat back, I said, in the blanket. Is he getting his rations? He did not answer me. That was the answer in itself. The prison was not a place for shared hardship anymore. It was a hole of desperation. You bloody beast, I swore. How dare you let him starve? The words flew out of my mouth without pause. Who are you to reprimand me, girl? He snarled, putting his face up to the bars. His breath stank of rotten teeth and snot pulled at the edge of his nostrils. He's a slave. He will not be treated the same as free men. He wiped his nose on the back of his hand. But you can remedy that, he said, with ease. I tried to keep my voice steady. How so? Curzon seized by a fit of coughing so violently I feared his ribs would crack. He choked on his spittle and fought for breath, then finally relaxed into a stupor, leaning against the window. Dibden glanced back at the other men in the cell before continuing. Our Captain Morris is on parole, lodged at the Gold, uh, Golden Hill Tavern, we hear. Go there and tell him that the men have fever and pox. One of our lads, Bridgeban, has a father and... Picks, uh, picks away with money and influence, and if the captain can get word to him, Bridgebane's father could arrange for a proper physician to attend to us here. Curzon coughed again and moaned, sweat glistened on his forehead. And the doctor would see to my brother, I said. Dibden hesitated, then gave a nod. Aye, and he gets a blanket and food. Dibden said something to a man I couldn't see. A blanket appeared on Curzon's shoulders, and Curzon clutched it around himself. And hat, my voice was ice. Dibden removed the hat and placed it on Curzon's head. Lay him down, he instructed, on the rushes, not the bare floor. Someone helped Curzon away from the window. I had no choice. I handed him the jam-covered burnt scones to the window. Dibden stuck the first in his mouth and passed the others to the men who suddenly crowded the window. If he dies, you will not see me again, I warned. Understood, he said. I found Captain. Captain Morse carrying out rubbish for the tavern keeper. He was a well-fed man wearing a brown coat trimmed with white that signified he was a prisoner of war. There was a big gap in his front teeth, but they looked clean enough. He joined me in the shadows of the alley and listened as we, or as I quickly explained my mission. I'll try to get word to Bridgeman's family tonight. It's against the law of war to treat prisoners so badly. How often can you stop there? Every morning. Good. Tell Dibden I'll see what I can do to ease their suffering. Suffering, though I fear it will not be enough. My brother is among the prisoners. He's ill. Can you, can I see to it that he is given his share of whatever Bridgeman provides? I surely will. Your brother was calm and brave during the first battle. He's a true soldier. The crow of the rooster interrupted and the sun was fighting through the leaden clouds. I picked up the buckets. I have to hurry. He nodded. Thank you for your help and my apologies, but I do not know your name. I am called Sal. Do you carry a last name as well, Sal? I hesitated. According to Madam, my surname was locked in, but it tasted foul in my mouth, and I shook my head. He smiled. Just Sal, then. Good, to, or good day to you, just Sal. Lucky for me, the overcast morning caused the other servants to sleep past their normal time. By the time Hannah and Mary staggered up from the cellar, I had porridge bubbling and the, uh, the tea steeping. I could not eat nor drink a thing, for my belly was tied up with fear. My thoughts Chased around and around in my brain pan. I could not visit the prison, or I could not visit the prison daily. I was sure to be caught and punished, but I had to visit the prison daily. Curzon's life depended on it. But someone would see me and was sure to remember the mark on my face. Word would get back to Madam, and she would tell Colonel Hawkins, and he would set someone to follow me, and Captain Morse would be flogged for passing on messages to the prisoners in Curzon's cell, would all be hung and buried in the pit. When I thought, uh, 
what they might do to me. I ran, I ran to the necessary and had me a long, good puking. But the next day, I made my way up there again. Food for the prisoners, waters for the lock-ins, and every once in a while, a message to the gap tooth man in the brown coat at Golden Hill Tavern. A few nights later, there was a terrible hubbaloo between Madam and the master when he announced at supper that he was planning or he was planning to travel to the next ship on London. He would carry messages to Parliament, conduct his own business, and likely return to New York by summer. Madam was not pleased. She uh, first she argued that she ought to go, then argued yes, he should go. He should should take her with him. Then, or when he refused, she threw a goblet in the fireplace and carried on so loudly that Master and Colonel Hawkins finally called for the carriage and left for the tavern. Madam dosed herself with strong wine and after that went to bed. The night, uh, that night, the temperatures fell so far below freezing that my biggest, the biggest fire could not keep away the chill. I moved my pallets uh, as close to the hearth as I dared and sat with my clothes, my cloak and my blanket all wrapped around me. It was so cold I could not sleep. General Washington and his men were holed up at Morristown. Folks said that they were desperate in need of stockings and food. I could scarce credit how hungry men with frozen feet could win a war. They were fools to even try. I waited as the clock first chimed eleven times and twelve, watching the firelight and trying the not to ponder. When I got up to add wood to the fire, my feet wandered themselves into the pantry and my hands pulled loose the boards there under the boards were some sheets of newsprint i had saved in a lead piece from the king statue my seeds the book given to me by my stationer i carved the uh the book to my or i carried the book to my warm palette and quietly untied uh, the twine and removed the paper wrapping i opened the cover a fellow named thomas Paine wrote a little book he called it common sense mama always said common sense was far from common that's why it was so special when you found it the first sentence of the book did not seem to contain any some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. It took four readings to try to figure out the meaning, which I took to be that life of folks is different than the world of which ro rules over them. Pain sure did a dance, uh, sure did dance a long time with the notion before he said it. I closed the book and longed for Robin, Robin Hood or Robinson Crusoe still stranded in the study where Colonel Hawkins was asleep. I did not dare rescue him. I opened the book again and attacked the next sentence.